The oxygen sensor. One component of your Subaru vehicle that's often overlooked and misunderstood. In today's video, we're going to take a look at the oxygen sensor, explain what it is, what it does, and why it's important to the overall health of your Subaru vehicle. So what is an oxygen sensor? Well, it's literally in the name. It's a sensor that senses oxygen. Well, obviously most of you probably put those two things together, but where is it located on the vehicle? Well, the oxygen sensor is part of your fuel injection system, and it's located in your vehicle's exhaust. Now the job of the oxygen sensor is to detect the amount of oxygen in your vehicle's exhaust and relay that data to your ECM or your PCM, your engine control module, or your powertrain control module. Now the ECM uses the data from the oxygen sensor to adjust your air fuel ratio. And it does so by changing your injector pulse width, your variable cam timing, and your spark. The oxygen sensor is a voltage creating, voltage generating sensor, also known as a galvanic cell or battery. It uses a chemical reaction to produce electrical energy. Oxygen sensors first appeared on vehicles in the 1970s. Volvo was the first vehicle manufacturer to put oxygen sensors on their vehicles. The oxygen sensor is very important to your vehicle. The oxygen sensor must be operational for your vehicle to enter closed loop status. In short, closed loop status is the point at which the ECM takes full control over varying all the parameters of your engine in real time based on the inputs from sensor data. So oxygen sensors produce their own voltage. How do they go about doing this? Well, firstly, there's several different styles of oxygen sensor, the most common of which is the zirconia ceramic style, which we'll be talking about in the video today. These sensors measure the difference between oxygen in the atmosphere in a air reference chamber within the sensor and the oxygen content in the exhaust. The differential between these measurements is what produces the voltage that they send to the PCM. So before we get into the actual chemistry of how the sensor works, let's step back really quickly and look at some of the previous iterations of oxygen sensors and how the design has changed over the years. I'll put a diagram up now of the first oxygen sensors. These were a one wire design. They had one wire coming out of the sensor supplying the voltage to the ECM. Now these sensors used the actual sensor's body, the threaded portion, to ground the sensor through the exhaust pipe. Now this was a very inefficient design because oxygen sensors need heat to work. They have to get extremely hot before the chemical reaction starts happening where they can send out a voltage to the ECM. So they relied on the heat of the exhaust and the heat of the engine to get the sensors up to temperature where they could start reading, start producing a voltage, and send that to the ECM. And they were very bad at grounding because grounding through the exhaust pipe was not great. So moving on, the next design was a two-wire sensor. Diagram on the screen now. We have the same voltage output wire, the same signal wire that the one-wire sensor had, but we've now added a ground wire. This was a much better ground than grounding through the sensor body into the exhaust pipe. So moving to this two-wire sensor was a great step. It gave it a standalone ground that was more efficient than grounding through the actual sensor in the tailpipe and was able to produce a cleaner and more effective signal for the ECM to use. Now there was still an issue with the two-wire sensor as it still relied on the heat of the exhaust to warm the sensor up to operational temperature for the sensor to start working it took so much longer for the sensor to read and the vehicle to switch from open loop to closed loop. So to fix these issues, they came out with a three-wire oxygen sensor, and we'll see the diagram now on screen for it. Now what they did here was they finally added a heating element inside the oxygen sensor. Now this heating element made the sensor get very hot and up the temperature much, much quicker, allowing it to start sending a voltage to the PCM to get from open loop to closed loop status much, much faster. Now with the three wire design, we've got the same signal wire, we've got the standalone ground wire for the signal, and now we've got a power wire sending power to the heating element and the heating element grounding out through the body of the oxygen sensor and the exhaust pipe like we had on the old one wire sensor. 
Now this too was inefficient. And then we came to the modern sensor, what most people have in their vehicle, which is a four wire oxygen sensor. Diagram for that on screen now. Now the only thing that we've added here is another standalone ground for our heating element. So we've got a signal wire, a ground wire for the signal, we've got a power wire for the heater, and a ground wire for the heater. That is the four wires in the four wire system. All right, so we know what the modern sensor looks like. We've added a heater to make it hot because these things have to get up to about 600 degrees Fahrenheit for them to work, for the chemistry to happen, for them to produce the voltage. Again, well, how does this actually work? We're gonna get into that right now. So another diagram on the screen really quickly to show you the cutaway of this sensor. Inside the sensor is something called the air reference chamber. Now this chamber allows outside air to flow into and out of the sensor. So when the reference air chamber's oxygen is heated, the molecules get excited. These excited molecules move from areas of high concentration to those of low concentration. Due to the movement of the oxygen ions from one platinum layer to the other, a potential difference is created, which in turn generates a small electrical voltage. So say you have a rich mixture in your exhaust. This will surge the voltage to approximately 0.9 or 1 volt. On the contrary, a lean mixture drops the voltage down to 0 volts or 0.1 volts. Less oxygen in the exhaust, the higher the voltage generated. The more oxygen in the exhaust, the lower the voltage generated. Again, they want to move from areas of high concentration to those of low concentration. So if you have a rich exhaust, those molecules of oxygen, those ions of oxygen want to move from the high concentration in the air reference chamber to the exhaust. And when they go across the membrane, they create that difference and create that small electrical voltage. So again, now these voltages are fed back to the ECM and the ECM uses these voltages and compares them against pre-programmed data the ECM uses this data for its calculations in changing the air fuel ratio. So if it sees a rich reading from the oxygen sensor, it will lean out the mixture for the next combustion cycle. The ECM is always shooting for stoichiometric, which is about 450 millivolts or 0.45 volt from the oxygen sensor. Now when it sees that it's getting a rich reading from the oxygen sensor, it's going to lean out for the next combustion cycle. In turn, if it sees a lean condition, it's going to richen up the fuel mixture for the next combustion cycle. It's constantly taking this data and going rich lean, rich lean, rich lean, trying to hit stoichiometric right there in the middle, right at the sweet spot. So closed loop versus open loop. We touched on this earlier in the video. What do these terms actually mean? So when your vehicle is cold, when you first start it in the morning, your vehicle is running in what's called open loop. Now this is where the ECM uses a set of lookup tables and store data based on outside temperatures and other metrics to run your engine. Now as we talked about with the oxygen sensor, it is temperature dependent to start reading and start sending data to the ECM. Well, at a certain point, the ECM will start getting all the data from all the sensors and when it has all the data from all the sensors it needs to make its own judgments and calculations, it will switch from open loop, which is a pre-programmed set of parameters, to closed loop, which is when the PCM changes all parameters, varies them all instantaneously based on the inputs given to it by the various sensors of the engine. Now closed loop is where you want to be because with closed loop, the engine can change your air fuel ratio, it can reduce pollutants, and it can run as optimal as possible. Open loop is just a base setup for the engine to run until it gets up the temperature to start using those sensor inputs. So on your Subaru vehicle, you could have a variable number of oxygen sensors. Now the majority of Subaru vehicles will have a minimum of two sensors one at the front and one at the rear, commonly known as upstream and downstream sensors. Now your upstream sensor will normally be located in your exhaust manifold, closer to the engine. Now this is the sensor that the PCM or ECM uses to calculate your fuel air ratio and optimize the running of the engine. Moving on to the rear sensor or downstream sensor, this sensor is normally located in the catalytic converter or beyond the catalytic converter in the exhaust stream. Now the ECM uses the data from this sensor to calculate the efficiency at which your catalytic converter is working. 
Now these sensors are different and they're not interchangeable, so be wary of that when you are changing your oxygen sensor. You wanna make sure that you get the proper sensor for the proper location that you're changing. Now, as I said, most Subarus will have two sensors. The older Subarus, there was one in the exhaust manifold pre-cat and one in the mid-pipe uh, post-cat. Now, there are some Subarus that use three oxygen sensors, four oxygen sensors, or I think that the California Mission ones actually use five oxygen sensors as well. So there can be any kind of number of these sensors. Now, I'm sure that most of you talking about oxygen sensors have heard the terms bank one, bank two, sensor one, sensor two. Well, bank one is normally the side of the engine that has cylinder number one in it. Bank two is normally the opposite. So, so sensor one would be the front or upstream sensors on the right or left of the engine. And the number two sensor would be the one's post cat, the downstream or rear sensor. So as an example, take the early 2000s H6 Outback. Those vehicles actually had three sensors. Two were upstream and one was downstream. There was one sensor in each of the exhaust collectors for each cylinder head, and there was one behind the catalytic converter. So one of the top reasons for a check engine light in most vehicles and Subaru vehicles is something that's gonna be oxygen sensor related. Not always, but there's lots of times that the check engine light coming on is gonna be something related to the oxygen sensor or a parameter that the oxygen sensor measures. So a lot of times when check engine lights come on in Subaru vehicles and other vehicles, people will go to local parts stores because they promise free code reading. And there's always that hook of they're in the business to sell you auto parts. They're not in the business to fix your car or diagnose your car. So a lot of times, anytime they pull a code related to any kind of auto part, they're gonna try to sell you that part. So again, these parts store employees, they're in the business of selling parts. So when they scan your car and an oxygen sensor related code comes up, ah, there you go. You need an oxygen sensor. Let's go inside and sell you an oxygen sensor for this car. Now, more times than not, an oxygen sensor code is not directly related to a bad oxygen sensor. It's something else. It can be a bad oxygen sensor, but more times than not, it's something else that is causing this oxygen sensor code to come on. A lot of times you'll see a oxygen sensor code for rich bank one or lean bank one or rich bank two or lean bank two. Now rarely are those an issue with the oxygen sensor. That's the oxygen sensor telling you you have another issue. If you've got a lean or rich condition by that oxygen sensor, normally it's because you have an exhaust leak or an intake leak on that side of the engine. If you've got a lean code, Likely you've got an intake gasket pulling too much air that the mass air sensor is not seeing. Or if you've got a rich code, perhaps you've got a bad exhaust manifold gasket and your exhaust is blowing out between the head and the exhaust manifold before it gets time to get to the oxygen sensor in red. Now these codes trip when the PCM sees this data and tries to change the air fuel ratio to no avail. No matter how much fuel it adds or takes away, it's not changing anything. So this when you get an issue, a code is flagged. Now, in a perfect world, an oxygen sensor is not really a maintenance item. It's not something that fails at a given interval, something that should be changed at a given time or a given mileage. But that said, there are times when they do fail. There are issues that do fail them, and there is the issue with age and how the sensor works due to its chemical reaction nature. So some things that can kill your oxygen sensor dead as a doornail. One, silicone poisoning. Anytime you use silicone, RTV, or any kind of sealer in your engine, you need to make sure that it says it's sensor safe. This includes if you're resealing your cam covers, uh, your rocker covers, your front engine cover, timing chain cover, intake gaskets, anything of that nature. If you don't use a sensor safe silicone RTV, you can very easily kill your oxygen sensors. They are susceptible to the compounds in these sealers if they're not sensor safe. And normally when you have this sensor uh, die over from silicone poison, you'll have a white powdery substance on it, a whitish color to the tip of the sensor. So another thing that can kill your oxygen sensor is oil contamination. Now oil can contaminate and kill your oxygen sensor in two different ways. One, from an external oil leak, that oil actually leaks onto the sensor, especially near the wiring, and the oil penetrates that air reference chamber. That will kill your sensor. 
The other way is internally. If your engine is consuming or burning engine oil, that engine oil in the exhaust can contaminate the outside of the sensor. When you look at the sensor, you'll likely have a dark residue on the outside of the sensor when it's oil contaminated. Moving on, here's a big one for Subaru owners, and that's coolant contamination. This is a big problem for older Subarus, older 2.5s that had head gasket issues. When you burn coolant and push it through the exhaust, that coolant will contaminate and kill your sensor. So if you have had an issue with head gaskets in the past, replace the head gaskets. It should be followed up with replacing the oxygen sensors because they're likely contaminated, depending on how long you drove it, with the blown head gasket. When you pull the sensor out, you'll normally see a greenish crust or greenish hue on the end of the sensor. Now, another big thing is physical damage. These sensors are particular to how they are handled. They have ceramic on the inside. If you drop them, you can crack the ceramic and rupture that air reference chamber and render the sensor useless. Also, if you have a loose, rusty exhaust, rattling loose exhaust can damage the sensor. If you go through uh, a lot of off-roading and go through mud or standing water, you can damage the sensor by getting stuff into the air reference chamber, the water, the mud, all that stuff can contaminate and kill the sensor. You can also cause damage from temperature shock. Driving in high, snowy, banked areas, if that hot, hot sensor hits very cold snow or ice, that can shock it enough to crack the sensor and cause it to be no good anymore. Fuel consumption contamination. If you have an extremely bad running engine that runs very rich, if you have a rich misfire, if you just haven't done a very good job at maintaining your engine, you can foul your oxygen sensor that way. And when you do, you'll normally see a dark, sooty buildup on the end of the oxygen sensor just for how much fuel is getting dumped into the exhaust stream. Another big no-no for your oxygen sensor is using dielectric grease on the connector. A lot of these sensors use the connector pigtail for their fresh air supply down through the sheathing of the wires into the sensor to the air reference chamber. And if you gum that up with dielectric grease, you're gonna starve out the sensor where it can't get that air into the air reference chamber. So just be cognizant of that. Another big issue is wire damage. Physical damage to the wiring harness, corrosion of the wires, or damage to the connectors. You always wanna make sure that your oxygen sensor wiring is in good condition, the wire, Insulation isn't chafed, there's no cut wires and no physical damage to it as well. Lastly, here's the big thing, and that is age. Now these sensors slowly die over time. Now again, there's no periodic maintenance, there's no magical year, date, or mileage to replace these things, but you have to be concerned about the age of them. This chemical reaction slows as age and time progress. So if you get up to about 100,000 miles or more and you start noticing that your fuel economy is getting worse or that your car is running a little rougher, it might be time just as a piece of maintenance to replace the oxygen sensors. There might not be any kind of fault, no check engine light, no kind of issue there, but they might just be getting old and worn out and need to be replaced. So that's another thing to consider too with your oxygen sensor is their age. So guys, there you have it. There's your intro to oxygen sensors and how they work in your Subaru vehicle. I know it was kind of long-winded, but there's a lot to cover here between the chemical reaction, what it does, how it does it, and issues you can have with it. We're gonna expand upon this in future videos as well as talk about other sensors in your vehicle as well. Again, this was just a brief intro. I say brief, but it was actually pretty long-winded. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you found this helpful and informative. I will see you guys in the next video.